story twenty six of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty six two powerful arguments got him you bet the questioner looked pleased yet not as if his pleasure engendered any mental excitement the man who answered spoke in an ordinary careless tone and with unmoved countenance as if he were merely signifying the employment of an additional workman or the purchase of a desirable rooster yet the subject of the brief conversation repeated above was no other than bill bowney the most industrious and successful of the horse thieves and road agents that honored the southern portion of california with their presence nor did bowney restrict himself to the duty of redistributing the property of other people perhaps he belonged to that class of political economists which consider superfluous population an evil perhaps he was a religious enthusiast and ardently longed that all mankind should speedily see the pearly gates of the new jerusalem be his motives what they might it is certain that when an unarmed man met bowney entered into a discussion with him and lived verbally to report the same he was looked upon with considerably more interest than a newly made congressman or a ten thousand acre farmer was able to inspire the two men whose conversation we have recorded studied the ears of their own horses for several minutes after which the first speaker asked how did you do it well replied the other man thar warn't anything particular about it me and him wasn't acquainted so he didn't suspect me but i knowed his face he was pinted out to me once durin the gold rush to kern river and i never forgot him i was on a road i never travelled before goin to see an old greaser ownin a mighty pretty piece of ground i wanted when all of a sudden i come on a cabin and thar stood a bill in front of it a-smokin i axed him for a light and when he came up to give it to me i grabbed him by the shirt collar and dug the spur into the mare twas kind of a mean trick imposin on hospitality that a way but twas bounty you know he hollered and i let him walk in front but i kept him covered with a revolver till i met some fellers that tied him good and tight twas an excitin worth a durn that is except when his wife i s'pose twas hollered then i almost wished i'd let him go sheriff got him inquired the first speaker well no returned the captor a sheriff and judge mean well i s'pose but they're slow mighty slow besides he's got friends and they might be too much for the sheriff some night we took him to the broad oak and we thought we'd ax the neighbors over thar to-night to talk it over be thar you bet replied the first speaker and i'll bring my friends nothing like having plenty of witnesses in important legal cases just so responded the other well here's till then and the two men separated the broad oak was one of those magnificent trees which are found occasionally through southern california singly or dispersed in handsome natural parks the specimen which had so impressed people as to gain a special name for itself was not only noted for its size but because it had occasionally been selected as the handiest place in which judge lynch could hold his court without fear of molestation by rival tribunals bill bowney under favorable circumstances appeared to be a very homely lazy sneaking sort of an individual but bill bowney covered with dust his eyes bloodshot his clothes torn and his hands and feet tightly bound had not a single attractive feature about him he stared earnestly up into the noble tree under whose shadow he lay but his glances were not of admiration they seemed rather to be resting on two or three fragments of rope which remained on one of the lower limbs and to express sentiments of the most utter loathing and disgust the afternoon wore away and the moon shone brilliantly down from the cloudless sky the tramp of a horse was heard at a distance but rapidly growing more distinct and soon bowney's captor galloped up to the tree then another horse was heard then others and soon a ten or a dozen men were gathered together each man after dismounting walked up to where the captive lay and gave him a searching look and then they joined those who had already preceded them and who were quietly chatting about wheat cattle trees uh, 
anything but the prisoner suddenly one of the party separated himself from the others and exclaimed gentlemen there don't seem to be anybody else a-comin we might as well tend to business i move that major burkus takes the chair if there's no objections no objections were made and major burkus a slight peaceable gentlemanly-looking man stepped out of the crowd and said you all know the object of this meeting gentlemen the first thing in order is to prove the identity of the prisoner needn't trouble yourself about that growled the prisoner i'm bill bowney and you're too cowardly to untie me though there be a dozen of you the prisoner admits he is bill bowney continued the major but of course no gentleman will take offence at his remarks has any one any charge to make against him charges cried an excitable farmer didn't i catch him untying my horse and riding off on him from budley's didn't i tell him to drop that animal and didn't he pretty near drop me instead charges here's the charge concluded the farmer pointing significantly to a scar on his own temple pity i didn't draw a better bead growled the prisoner the hoss only fetched two ounces prisoner admits stealing mr bark's horse and firing on mr bark any further evidence rather growled an angular gentleman i was going up the valley by the stage and all of a sudden the driver stopped where there wa'n't no station there was fellers had hold of the leaders and there was pistols pinted at the driver and folks in general then our money and watches was took and the fellow that took mine had a cross-cut scar on the back of his hand right hand maybe somebody look at bills the prisoner was carried into the moonlight and the back of his right hand was examined by the major the prisoner was again placed under the tree ah, the cuts there as described said the major anything else thar's this much said another i busted up flat you all know on account of the dry season last year and i hadn't nothing left but my hoss bill bowney knowed it as well as anybody else yet he came and stole that hoss it pawed like thunder and woke me up for twas night and light as tis now and i seed bowney a ridin him off twas a sneakin mean cowardly trick the prisoner hung his head he would plead guilty to theft and attempt to kill and defy his captors to do their worst but when meanness and cowardice were proved against him he seemed ashamed of himself prisoner virtually admits the charge said the major looking critically at bowney gentlemen said caney late of texas what's the use of wasting time this way everybody knows that bowney's been at the bottom of all the deviltry that's been done in the county this three year highway robbery a hangin offence in texas and every other well-regulated state so's hoss stealin and so shootin a man in the back and yit bowney's done every one of em over and over again everybody knows what we come here for else what's the reason every man's got a nice little coil of rope in his saddle fur the longer the business is put off the harder it'll be to do i move we string em up instanter second the motion exclaimed some one i move we give him a chance to save himself said a quiet farmer from new england when he's in the road agent business he has a crowd to help him now twould do us more good to clean them out than him alone so let's give him a chance to leave the state if he'll tell who this confederates are somebody'll have to take care of him of course till we can catch them and make sure of it twon't cost the somebody much then said the prisoner firmly and i'll give a cool thousand for a shot at any low-lived coyote that acts me to do such an ungentlemanly thing spoke like a man said caney of texas i hope you'll die easy for that bill the original motion prevails said the major all in favor will say aye a decided aye broke from the party whoever has the tallest horse will please lead him up and unsaddle him said the major after a slight pause the witnesses will take the prisoner in charge a horse was brought under the limb with the fragments of rope upon it and the witnesses one of them bearing a piece of rope approached the prisoner the silence was terrible and the feelings of all present were greatly relieved when bill bowney placed on the horse and seeing the rope hauled taut and fastened to a bough by a man in the tree broke into a frenzy of cursing and displayed the defiant courage peculiar to an animal at bay has the prisoner anything to say asked the major as bowney stopped for breath 
better own up and save yourself and reform and help rid the world of those other scoundrels pleaded the new englander don't you do it bill don't you do it cried caney of texas stick to your friends and die like a man that's me said the prisoner directing a special volley of curses at the new englander it's been said here that i was sneakin and cowardly there's one way of givin that feller the lie hurry up and do it when i raise my hand said the major lead the horse away and may the lord have mercy on your soul bounty amen fervently exclaimed the new englander again there was a moment of terrible silence and when a gentle wind swept over the wild oats and through the tree there seemed to sound on the air a sigh and a shudder suddenly all the horses started and pricked up their ears somebody comin whispered one of the party sheriff's got wind of the arrangements maybe comes from the wrong direction replied caney of texas quickly it's somebody on foot and tired and light-footed there's two or three dunno know what kind of beings they can be thunder and lightnin caney's concluding remark was inspired by the sudden appearance of a woman who rushed into the shadow of the tree stopped looked wildly about for a moment and then threw herself against the prisoner's feet and uttered a low pitiful cry there was a low murmur from the crowd and the major cried take him down give him fifteen minutes with his wife and see if she don't untie him the man in the tree loosened the rope bowney was lifted off and placed on the ground again and the woman threw herself on the ground beside him caressed his ugly face and wailed pitifully the judge and jury fidgeted about restlessly still the horses stood on the alert and soon three came through the oats three children all crying as they saw the men they became dumb and stood mute and frightened staring at their parents they were not pretty they were not even interesting mother and children were alike unwashed uncombed shoeless and clothed in dirty faded calico the children were all girls the oldest not more than ten years old and the youngest scarcely five none of them pleaded for the prisoner but still the woman wailed and moaned and the children stood staring in dumb piteousness the major stood quietly gazing at the face of his watch there was not in southern california a more honest man than major burkus yet the minute hand of his watch had not indicated more than one half of fifteen minutes when he exclaimed time's up the men approached the prisoner the woman threw her arms around him and cried my husband oh god madam said the major your husband's life is in his own hands he can save himself by giving the names of his confederates and leaving the state i'll tell you who they are cried the woman god curse you if you do whispered boney from between his teeth better let him be madam argued caney of texas he'd better die like a man than go back on his friends might tell us which of em was a man enough to fetch you and the young uns here we'll try to be easy on him when we catch him none of em sobbed the woman we walked and i took turns toting the young uns my husband oh god my husband beg your pardon ma'am said bowney's captor but nobody can't believe that it's nigh unto twenty mile i'd ha done it if i had been fifty cried the woman angrily when he was in trouble oh god oh god don't you believe it then look here she picked up the smallest child as she spoke and in the dim light the men saw that its little feet were torn and bleeding twas their blood or his'n replied the woman rapidly and i didn't know how to choose between em god of mercy on me i'm not crazy caney of texas took the child from its mother and carried it to where the moonlight was unobstructed he looked carefully at its feet and then shouted bring the prisoner out here two men carried bowney to where caney was standing and the whole party with the woman and remaining children followed bill said caney i ain't askin yer to go back on your friends but them is look at em and caney held the child's feet before the father's eyes while the woman threw her arms around his neck and the two older children crept up to the prisoner and laid their faces against his legs they're a-talkin to your bill resumed caney of texas and they're the convincinest talkers i ever seed 
the desperado turned his eyes away but caney moved the child so its bleeding feet were still before its father's eyes the remaining men all retired beneath the shadow of the tree for the tender little feet were talking to them too and they were ashamed of the results suddenly bowney uttered a deep groan tain't no use a tryin said he in a resigned tone everybody be down on me and after all i've done too but yer can have their names curse ye the woman went into hysterics the children cried caney of texas ejaculated bully and then kissed the poor little bruised feet the new englander fervently exclaimed thank god i'll answer for him till we get him said caney after the major had written down the names bounty gave him and continued caney somebody get the rest of these young uns and their mother to my cabin powerful quick good lord don't i just wish there was boys i'd adopt the whole family the court informally adjourned sine die but had so many meetings afterward at the same place to dispose of bounty's accomplices that his freedom was considered fairly purchased and he and his family were located a good way from the scenes of his most noted exploits end of story twenty six story twenty seven of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty seven mr putchett's love just after two o'clock on a july afternoon mr putchett mounted several stats of the sub-treasury in wall street and gazed inquiringly up and down the street to the sentimental observer mr putchett's action in taking the position we have indicated may have seemed to signify that mr putchett was of an aspiring disposition and that in ascending the steps he exemplified his desire to get above the curbstone whose name was used as a qualifying adjective whenever mr putchett was mentioned as a broker those persons however who enjoyed the honour of mr putchett's acquaintance immediately understood that the operator in question was in funds that day and that he had taken the position from which he could most easily announce his moneyed condition to all who might desire assistance from him it was rather late in the day for business and certain persons who had until that hour been unsuccessful in obtaining the accommodations desired were not at all particular whether their demands were satisfied in a handsome office or under the only roof that can be enjoyed free of rent there came to mr putchett oddly clothed members of his own profession and offered for sale securities whose numbers mr putchett compared with those on a list of bonds stolen men who deposited with him small articles of personal property principally jewellery as collaterals on small loans at short time and usurious rates men who stood before him on the sidewalk caught his eye summoned him by a slight motion of the head and disappeared around the corner whither mr putchett followed them only to promptly transact business and hurry back to his business stand in fact mr putchett was very busy as in his case business invariably indicated profit it was not wonderful that his rather unattractive face lightened and expressed its owner's satisfaction at the amount of business he was doing suddenly however there attacked mr putchett the fate which in its peculiarity of visiting people in their happiest hours has been bemoaned by poets of genuine and doubtful inspiration from the days of the sweet singer of israel unto those of that sweet singer of aaron whose recital of experience with young gazelles illustrates the remorselessness of the fate alluded to plainly speaking mr putchett went suddenly under a cloud for during one of his dashes around the corner after a man who had signalled him and at the same time commenced to remove a ring from his finger a small dirty boy handed mr putchett a soiled card on which was pencilled bailey is after you about that diamond despite the fact that mr putchett had not been shaved for some days and had apparently neglected the duty of facial ablution for quite as long a time he turned pale and looked quickly behind him and across the street then muttering just my luck 
and a few other words more desponding than polite in nature he hurried to the post office where he pencilled and dispatched a few postal cards signed in initials only announcing an unexpected and temporary absence then still looking carefully and often at the faces in sight he entered a newspaper office and consulted a railway directory he seemed in doubt as he rapidly turned the leaves and when he reached the timetable of a certain road running near and parallel to the seaside the change in his countenance indicated that he had learned the whereabouts of a city of refuge an hour later mr putchett having to bid no family good-bye to care for no securities save those stowed away in his capacious pockets and freed from the annoyance of baggage by reason of the fact that he had on his back the only outer garments that he owned was rapidly leaving new york on a train which he had carefully assured himself did not carry the dreaded bailey once fairly started mr putchett in some measure recovered his spirits he introduced himself to a brakeman by means of a cigar and questioned him until he satisfied himself that the place to which he had purchased a ticket was indeed unknown to the world being far from the city several miles from the railroad and on a beach where boats could not safely land he also learned that it was not a fashionable summer resort and that a few farmhouses whose occupants took summer boarders and an unsuccessful hotel were the only buildings in the place arrived at his destination mr putchett registered at the hotel and paid the week's board which the landlord after a critical survey of his new patron demanded in advance then the exiled operator tilted a chair in the bar-room lit an execrable cigar and instead of expressing sentiments of gratitude appropriate to the occasion gave way to profane condemnations of the bad fortune which had compelled him to abandon his business he hungrily examined the faces of the few fishermen of the neighbouring bay who came in to drink and smoke but no one of them seemed likely to need money certainly no one of them seemed to have acceptable collaterals about his person or clothing on the contrary these men while each one threw mr putchett a stare of greater or less magnitude let the financier alone so completely that he was conscious of a severe wound in his self-esteem it was a strange experience and at first it angered him so that he strode up to the bar ordered a glass of best brandy and defiantly drank alone but neither the strength of the liquor nor the intensity of his anger prevented him from soon feeling decidedly lonely at the cheap hotel at which he lodged when in new york there was no one who loved him or even feared him but there were a few men of his own kind who had for purposes of mutual recreation tabooed business transactions with each other and among these he found a grim sort of enjoyment of companionship at least here however he was so utterly alone as to be almost frightened and the murmuring and moaning of the surf on the beach near the hotel added to his loneliness a sense of terror almost overcome by dismal forebodings mr putchett hurried out of the hotel and toward the beach once upon the sands he felt better the few people who were there were strangers of course but they were women and children and if the expression of those who noticed him was wondering it was inoffensive at times even pitying and mr putchett was in a humour to gratefully accept even pity soon the sun fell and the people straggled toward their respective boarding-houses and mr putchett to fight off loneliness as long as possible rose from the bench on which he had been sitting and followed the party up the beach he had supposed himself the last person that left the beach but in a moment or two he heard a childish voice shouting mister mister i guess you've lost something mr putchett turned quickly and saw a little girl six or seven years of age running toward him in one hand she held a small pail and wooden shovel and in the other something bright which was too large for her little hand to cover 
she reached the broker's side turned up a bright healthy face opened her hand and displayed a watch and said it was right there on the bench where you were sitting i couldn't think what it was it shone so mr putchett at first looked suspiciously at the child for he had at one period of his life laboured industriously in the business of dropping bogus pocket-books and watches and obtaining rewards from persons claiming to be their owners examining the watch which the child handed him however he recognized it as one upon which he had lent twenty dollars earlier in the day first prudently replacing the watch in the pocket of his pantaloons so as to avoid any complication while settling with the finder he handed the child a quarter oh no thank you said she hastily mamma gives me money whenever i need it the experienced operator immediately placed the fractional currency where it might not tempt the child to change her mind then he studied her face with considerable curiosity and asked do you live here oh no she replied we're only spending the summer here we live in new york mr putchett opened his eyes whistled and remarked it's very funny why i don't think so said the child very innocently lots of people that board here come from new york don't you want to see my well i dug the deepest well of anybody to-day just come and see it's only a few steps from here mechanically as one straggling with a problem above his comprehension the financier followed the child and gazed into a hole perhaps a foot and a half deep on the beach that's my well said she and the one next is frank's nelly's is way up there i guess hers would have been the biggest but a wave came up and spoiled it mr putchett looked from the well into the face of its little digger and was suddenly conscious of an insane desire to drink some of the water he took the child's pail dipped some water and was carrying it to his lips when the child spoiled what was probably the first sentimental feeling of mr putchett's life by hastily exclaiming you mustn't drink that it's salty the sentimentalist sorrowfully put the bitter draught away and the child rattled on if you're down here to-morrow i'll show you where we find scallop shells maybe you can find some with pink and yellow spots on them i've got some if you don't find any i'll give you one thank you said her companion just then some one shouted alice and the child exclaiming mamma's calling me good-bye hurried away while the broker walked slowly toward the hotel with an expression of countenance which would have hidden him from his oldest acquaintance mr putchett spent the evening on the piazza instead of in the bar-room and he neither smoked nor drank before retiring he contracted with the colored cook to shave him in the morning and to black his boots and he visited the single store of the neighborhood and purchased a shirt some collars and a cravat while in the morning he was duly shaved dressed and brushed he critically surveyed himself in the glass and seemed quite dissatisfied he moved from the glass spread a newspaper on the table and put into it the contents of his capacious pockets a second examination before the glass seemed more satisfactory in result thus indicating that to the eye of mr putchett his well-stuffed pockets had been unsightly in effect the paper and its contents he gave the landlord to deposit in the hotel safe then he ate a hurried scanty breakfast and again sought the bench on the beach no one was in sight for it was scarcely breakfast time at the boarding-houses so he looked for little alice's well and mourned to find that the tide had not even left any sign of its location then he seated himself on the bench again contemplating his boots looked up the road stared out to sea and then looked up the road again tried to decipher some of the names carved on the bench walked backward and forward looking up the road at each turn he made and in every way indicated the unpleasant effect of hope deferred finally however after two hours of fruitless search mr putchett's eyes were rewarded by the sight of little alice approaching the beach with the bathing party he at first hurried forward to meet her but he was restrained by a sentiment found alike in curbstone brokers and in charming young ladies 
a feeling that it is not well to give oneself away without first being sufficiently solicited to do so he noticed with a mingled pleasure and uneasiness that little alice did not at first recognize him so greatly had his toilette altered his general appearance even after he made himself known he was compelled to submit to further delay for the party had come to the beach to bathe and little alice must bathe too she emerged from a bathing-house in a garb very odd to the eyes of mr putchett but one which did not at all change that gentleman's opinion of the wearer she ran into the water was thrown down by the surf she was swallowed by some big waves and dived through others and all the while the veteran operator watched her with a solicitude which despite his anxiety for her safety gave him a sensation as delightful as it was strange the bath ended alice rejoined mr putchett and conducted him to the spot where the wonderful shells with pink and yellow spots were found the new shell-seeker was disgusted when the child shouted come along to several other children and was correspondingly delighted when they said in substance that shells were not so attractive as once they were mr putchett's researches in conchology were not particularly successful for while he manfully moved about in the uncomfortable and ungraceful position peculiar to shell-seekers he looked rather at the healthy honest eager little face near him than at the beach itself suddenly however mr putchett's opinion of shells underwent a radical change for the child straightening herself and taking something from her pocket exclaimed oh dear somebody's picked up all the pretty ones i thought maybe there mightn't be any here so i brought you one just see what pretty pink and yellow spots there are on it mr putchett looked and there came into his face the first flush of colour that had been there except in anger for years he had occasionally received presents from business acquaintances but he had correctly looked on them as having been forwarded as investments so they awakened feelings of suspicion rather than of pleasure but at little alice's shell he looked long and earnestly and when he put it into his pocket he looked for two or three moments far away and yet at nothing in particular do you have a nice boarding-house asked alice as they sauntered along the beach stopping occasionally to pick up pebbles and to dig wells oh not very said mr putchett the sanded bar-room and his own rather dismal chamber coming to his mind you ought to board where we do said alice enthusiastically we have heaps of fun have you got a barn mr putchett confessed that he did not know oh we've got a splendid one exclaimed the child there's stalls and a granary and a carriage house and two lofts in it we put out hay to the horses and they eat it right out of our hands aren't afraid a bit then we get into the granary and bury ourselves all up in the oats so only our heads stick out the lofts are just lovely one's full of hay and the other's full of wheat and we chew the wheat and make gum of it the haystalks are real nice and sweet to chew too they only cut the hay last week and we all rode in on the wagon one two three four seven of us then we've got two croquet sets and the boys make us whistles and squawks squawks interrogated the broker yes they're split quills and you blow on them they don't make very pretty music but it's ever so funny we've got two big swings and a hammock too is the house very full asked mr putchett not so very replied the child if you come there to board i'll make frank teach you how to make whistles that afternoon mr putchett took the train for new york from which city he returned the next morning with quite a well-filled trunk it was afterwards stated by a person who had closely observed the capitalist's movements during his trip that he had gone into a first-class clothiers and demanded suits of the best material and latest cut regardless of cost and that he had pursued the same singular course at a gent's furnishing store and a fashionable jeweller's 
certain it is that on the morning of mr putchett's return a gentleman very well dressed though seemingly ill at ease in his clothing called at mrs brown's boarding-house and engaged a room and that the younger ladies pronounced him very stylish and the older ones thought him very odd but as he never intruded spoke only when spoken to and devoted himself earnestly and entirely to the task of amusing the children the boarders all admitted that he was very good-hearted among alice's numerous confidences during her second stroll with mr putchett was information as to the date of her seventh birthday now very near at hand when the day arrived her adorer rose unusually early and spent an impatient hour or two awaiting alice's appearance as she bade him good morning he threw about her neck a chain to which was attached an exquisite little watch then while the delighted child was astonishing her parents and the other boarders mr putchett betook himself to the barn in a state of abject sheepishness he did not appear again until summoned by the breakfast bell and even then he sat with a very red face and with eyes directed at his plate only the child's mother remonstrated against so much money being squandered on a child and attempted to return the watch but he seemed so distressed at the idea that the lady dropped the subject for a fortnight mr putchett remained at the boarding-house and grew daily in the estimation of every one from being thought queer and strange he gradually gained the reputation of being the best-hearted most guileless most considerate man alive he was the faithful squire of all the ladies both young and old and was adored by all the children his conversational powers except on matters of business were not great but his very ignorance on all general topics and the humility born of that ignorance gave to his manners a deference which was more gratifying to most ladies than brilliant loquacity would have been he even helped little alice to study a sunday-school lesson and the experience was so entirely new to him that he became more deeply interested than the little learner herself he went to church on sunday and was probably the most attentive listener the rather prosy old pastor had of course he bathed everybody did a stout rope was stretched from a post on the shore to a buoy in deep water where it was anchored and back and forth on this rope capered every day twenty or thirty hideously dressed but very happy people among whom might always be seen mr putchett with a child on his shoulder one day the waves seemed to viciously break near the shore and the bathers all followed the rope out to where there were swells instead of breakers mr putchett was there of course with little alice he seemed perfectly enamoured of the water and delighted in venturing as far to the sea as the rope would allow and there ride on the swells and go through all other ridiculously happy antics peculiar to ocean lovers who cannot swim suddenly mr putchett's hand seemed to receive a shock and he felt himself sinking lower than usual while above the noise of the surf and the confusion of voices he heard some one roar the rope has broken scramble ashore the startled man pulled frantically at the piece of rope in his hand but found to his horror that it offered no assistance it was evident that the break was between him and the shore he kicked and paddled rapidly but seemed to make no headway and while alice realizing the danger commenced to cry piteously mr putchett plainly saw on the shore the child's mother in an apparent frenzy of excitement and terror the few men present most boarding-house keepers and also ex-sailors and fishermen hastened with a piece of the broken rope to drag down a fishing-boat which lay on the sand beyond reach of the tide meanwhile a boy found a fishing-line to the end of which a stone was fastened and thrown toward the imperiled couple mr putchett snatched at the line and caught it and in an instant half a dozen women pulled upon it only to have it break almost inside mr putchett's hands again it was thrown and again the frightened broker caught it this time he wound it about alice's arm put the end into her hand kissed her forehead and said 
good-bye little angel god bless you and threw up his hand as a signal that the line should be drawn in in less than a minute little alice was in her mother's arms but when the line was ready to be thrown again mr putchett was not visible by this time the boat was at the water's edge and four men two of whom were familiar with rowing sat at the oars while two of the old fishermen stood by to launch the boat at the proper instant suddenly they shot it into the water but the clumsy dip of an oar turned it broadside to the wave and in an instant it was thrown waterlogged upon the beach several precious moments were spent in righting the boat and bailing out the water after which the boat was safely launched the fishermen sprang to the oars and in a moment or two were abreast the buoy mr putchett was not to be seen even had he reached the buoy it could not have supported him for it was but a small stick of wood one of the boarders he who had swamped the boat dived several times and finally there came to the surface a confused mass of humanity which separated into the forms of the diver and the broker a few strokes of the oars beached the boat and old captain redding who had spent his winters at a government life-saving station picked up mr putchett carried him up the dry sand laid him face downward raised his head a little and shouted somebody stand between him and the sun so's to shade his head slap his hands one man to each hand scrape up some of that hot dry sand and pile it on his feet and legs everybody else stand off and give him air the captain's orders were promptly obeyed and there the women and children some of them weeping and all of them pale and silent stood in a group in front of the bathing-house and looked up somebody run to the hotel for brandy shouted the captain here's brandy said a strange voice and i've got a hundred dollars for you if you bring him to life every one looked at the speaker and seemed rather to dislike what they saw he was a smart-looking man but his face seemed very cold and forbidding he stood apart with arms folded and seemed regardless of the looks fastened upon him finally mrs blow one of the most successful and irrepressible gossips in the neighbourhood approached him and asked him if he was a relative of mr putchett's no ma'am replied the man with unmoved countenance i'm an officer with a warrant for his arrest on suspicion of receiving stolen goods i've searched his traps at the hotel and boarding-house this morning but can't find what i'm looking for it's been traced to him though has he shown any of you ladies a large diamond no said mrs blow quite tartly and none of us would have believed it of him either i suppose not said the officer his face softening a little i've seen plenty of such cases before though besides it isn't my first call on putchett not by several mrs blow walked indignantly away but true to her nature she quickly repeated her news to her neighbours he's coming too shouted the captain turning mr putchett on his back and attempting to provoke respiration the officer was by his side in a moment mr putchett's eyes had closed naturally the captain said and his lips had moved suddenly the stranger laid a hand on the collar of the insensible man and disclosed a cord about his neck captain said the officer in a voice very low but hurried and trembling with excitement putchett's had a very narrow escape and i hate to trouble him but i must do my duty there's been a five thousand dollar diamond traced to him he advanced money on it knowing it was stolen i've searched his property and can't find it but i'll bet a thousand it's on that string around his neck that's putchett all over now you let me take it and i'll let him alone nobody else need know what's happened he seems to have behaved himself here judging by the good opinion folks have of him and he deserves to have a chance which he won't get if i take him to jail the women had comprehended from the look of the stranger and the captain that something unusual was going on and they had crowded nearer and nearer until they heard the officer's last words you're a dreadful hateful man exclaimed little alice the officer winced hush daughter said alice's mother and then she said let him take it captain it's too awful to think of a man's going right to prison from the gates of death 
the officer did not wait for further permission but hastily opened the bathing dress of the still insensible figure suddenly the officer started back with an oath and the people saw fastened to a string and lying over mr putchett's heart a small scallop shell variegated with pink and yellow spots it's one i gave him when i first came here because he couldn't find any sobbed little alice the officer seeming suddenly to imagine that the gem might be secreted in the hollow of the shell snatched at it and turned it over mr putchett's arm suddenly moved his hand grasped the shell and carried it toward his lips his eyes opened for a moment and fell upon the officer at the sight of whom mr putchett shivered and closed his eyes again that chill's a bad sign muttered the captain mr putchett's eyes opened once more and sought little alice his face broke into a faint smile and she stooped and kissed him the smile on his face grew brighter for an instant then he closed his eyes and quietly carried the case up to a court of final appeals before which the officer showed no desire to give evidence mr putchett was buried the next day and most of the people in the neighbourhood were invited to the funeral the story went rapidly about the neighbourhood and in consequence there were present at the funeral a number of uninvited persons among these were the cook barkeeper and hostler of the hotel who stood uncomfortably a little way from the house until the procession started when they followed at a respectable distance in the rear when the grave was reached those who dug it who were also of those who carried the beer were surprised to find the bottom of the coffin box strewn and hidden with wild flowers and scraps of evergreen the service of the church of england was read and as the words ashes to ashes dust to dust were repeated a bouquet of wild flowers was tossed over the heads of the mourners and into the grave mrs blow though deeply affected by the services looked quickly back to see who was the giver and saw the officer who had not been seen before that day with such an embarrassed countenance as to leave no room for doubt he left before daylight next morning to catch a very early train but persons passing the old graveyard that day beheld on putchett's grave a handsome bush of white roses which bush old mrs gale living near the hotel declared was a darling pot plant which had been purchased of her on the previous evening by an ill-favoured man who declared he must have it no matter how much he paid for it End of story 27story twenty eight of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty eight the meanest man at blugsey's to miners whose gold fever had not reached a ridiculous degree of heat blugsey's was certainly a very satisfactory location the dirt was rich the river ran dry there was plenty of standing room on the banks which were devoid of rocks the storekeeper dealt strictly on the square and the saloon contained a pleasing variety of consolatory fluids which were dispensed by stumpy flukes ex-sailor and as hearty a fellow as any one would wish to see all thieves and claim jumpers had been shot as fast as discovered and the men who remained had taken each other's measures with such accuracy that genuine fights were about as infrequent as prayer meetings the miners dug and washed ate drank swore and gambled with that delightful freedom which exists only in localities where society is established on a firm and well-settled basis such being the condition of affairs at blugsey's it seemed rather strange one morning hours after breakfast to see sprinkled in every direction a great number of idle picks shovels and pans in fact the only mining implements in use that morning were those handled by a single miner who was digging and carrying and washing dirt with an industry which seemed to indicate that he was working as a substitute for each and every man in the camp he was anything but a type of gold hunters in general he was short and thin and slight and stooping and greatly round-shouldered 
his eyes were of a painfully uncertain grey and one of them displayed a cast which was his only striking feature his nose had started as a very retiring nose but had changed its mind halfway down his lips were thin and seemed to yearn for a close acquaintance with his large ears his face was sallow and thin and thickly seamed and his chin appeared to be only one of nature's hasty afterthoughts long thin grey hair hung about his face and imparted the only relief to the monotonous dinginess of his features and clothing such being the appearance of the man it was scarcely natural to expect that miners in general would regard him as a special ornament to the profession in fact he had been dubbed old scrabble grab on the second day of his occupancy of claim number thirty two and such of his neighbours as possessed the gift of tongues had after more intimate acquaintance with him expressed themselves doubtful of the ability of language to properly embody scrabble grab's character in a single name the principal trouble was that they were unable to make anything at all of his character there was nothing about him which they could understand so they first suspected him and then hated him violently after the usual manner of society toward the incomprehensible and on the particular morning which saw scrabble grab the only worker at blugsey's the remaining miners were assembled in solemn conclave at stumpy fluke's saloon to determine what was to be done with the detested man the scene was certainly an impressive one for such quiet had not been known in the saloon since the few moments which intervened between the time weeks before when broadhorn jerry gave the lie to captain greed and the captain whose pistol happened to be unloaded was ready to proceed to business the average miner when sober possesses a degree of composure and gravity which would be admirable even in a judge of ripe experience and miners assembled as a deliberative body can display a dignity which would drive a venerable senator or a british m p to the uttermost extreme of envy on the occasion mentioned above the miners ranged themselves near the unoccupied walls and leaned at various graceful and awkward angles boston ben who was by natural right the ruler of the camp took the chair that is he leaned against the centre of the bar on the other side of the bar leaned stumpy flukes displaying that degree of conscious importance which was only becoming to a man who by virtue of his position was sole and perpetual secretary and recorder to all stated meetings at blugsey's boston ben glanced around the room and then collectively announced the presence of a quorum the formal organization of the meeting and its readiness for deliberation by quietly remarking blaze away immediately one of the leaners regained the perpendicular departed a pace from the wall rolled his tobacco neatly into one cheek and remarked we stood it long enough the bottom's clean out of the pan mr chairman scrabblegrabs declined bitters from half the fellows in camp and though his grey old topknots kept him from taking satisfaction in the usual manner they don't feel no better about it than they did the speaker subsided into his section of wall composed himself into his own special angles and looked like a man who had fully discharged a conscientious duty from the opposite wall there appeared another speaker who indignantly remarked going back on bitters ain't a toothful to what he's done there's young curly that went last week that boy played his hand in a style that would take the conceit clean out of an angel but all to once curly took to lookin flaxed and the judge here overheard scrabble grab askin curly what he thought his mother'd say if she knew he was makin his money that way the boy took on wuss and wuss and now he's vamoosed don't believe me if you don't want to fellers here's the judge hisself the judge briskly advanced his spectacles which had gained him his title and said true as gospel and when i asked him if he wasn't ashamed of himself for taking away the boy's comfort he said no and that i'd be a more decent man if i give up kids myself he's alive yet said the first speaker in a tone half of inquiry and half of reproof i know it said the judge hastening to explain 
i'd lent my pepper-box to mose when he went to frisco and the old man's too little for a man of my size to hit the judge looked anxiously about until he felt assured his explanation had been generally accepted and then he continued what's he good for anyhow he can't sing a song except something about jesus and tasteless hours that nobody's ever heard before and don't want to again he don't drink he don't play cards he don't even discuss when he tumbles into the river every man's got his pints and if he hain't got no good uns he's sure to have bad uns if he'd only show em out there might be something honest about it but when a feller just eats and sleeps and works and never shows any of the tastes of a gentleman there's something wrong i don't wish him any harm said a tall good-natured fellow who succeeded the judge but the feller's looks is again the reputation of the place in a camp like this here one of our society's first class no greasers nor pigtails nor loafers it ain't the thing to have anybody round that looks like a corkscrew that's been fed on green apples and watered with vinegar it's discouraging to gentlemen that might have a notion of staking a claim for the sake of enjoying our social advantages then none of yer have got the worst of it yet remarked another the old cuss is too fond of his dust billy banks seen him a-buyin pork up to the store and he handled his pouch as if twas eggs instead of gold dust poured it out as careful as yer please and even scraped up a little bit he spilt now when i was a little rat and went to sunday school they used to keep a wagon at me about evil communication a corruptin a good manners that's what he'll do first thing you know other fellows will begin to be stingy and think gold dust was made to save instead of to buy drinks and play cards for that's what it'll come to beggin everybody's pardon interposed a deserter from the army but these here proceedings is irregular tain't the square thing to take evidence till the prisoner's in court boston ben immediately detailed a special officer to summon old scrabblegrab declared a recess of five minutes and invited the boys to drink with him those who took sugar in theirs had the cup dashed from their lips just as they were draining the delicious dregs for the officer and culprit appeared and the chairman wrapped the assembly to order boston ben had been an interested attendant at certain law courts in the states so in the calm consciousness of his acquaintance with legal procedure he rapidly arraigned scrabblegrab scrabblegrab you're complained of for going back on bitters coaxin curly to give up cards thus spoiling his fun and knockin appreciatin observers out of their amusement of insultin the judge of not cussin when you stumble into the river of not havin any good pints and not showin your bad ones of bein a setback on the tone of the place lookin like a green apple fed vinegar water corkscrew or words to that effect and finally in savin your money what have you got to say again sentence bein passed on you the old man flushed as the chairman proceeded and when the indictment reached its end he replied in a tone which indicated anything but respect for the court i've got just this to say that i paid my way here i've asked no odds of any man since i've been here and that anybody that takes pains to meddle in my affairs is an impudent scoundrel saying which the old man turned to go while the court was paralyzed into silence but tom dosser a new arrival and a famous shot now stepped in front of the old man i ask your parding said tom in the blandest of tones but of course you didn't mean me when you mentioned impudent scoundrels yes i did i meant you and everybody like you replied the old man tom's hand moved toward his pistol the chairman expeditiously got out of range stumpy flukes promptly retired to the extreme end of the bar and groaned audibly the old man was in the wrong but then wasn't it too mean when blood was so hard to get out that these difficulties always took place just after he'd got the floor clean i don't generally shoot till the other feller draws explained tom dosser while each man in the room wept with emotion as they realized they had lived to see tom's skill displayed before their very eyes i don't generally shoot till the other feller draws but you'd better be spry i usually make a little allowance for age but 
tom's further explanations were indefinitely delayed by an abnormal contraction of his trachea the same being induced by the old man's right hand while his left seized the unhappy thomas by his waist belt and a second later the dead shot of blugsey's was tossed into the middle of the floor somewhat as the sheaf of oats is tossed by a practised hand anybody else inquired the old man i'll back vermont bone and muscle again the whole passel of ye even if i be a deacon the angel of the lord encampeth round about them that fear him the angel needn't hurry hisself said tom dosser picking himself up one joint at a time if that's the crowd you're travelling with and they've got a grip anything like yourn i don't want nothing to do with em boston ben looked excited and roared this court's adjourned sine die then he rushed up to the newly announced deacon caught him firmly by the right hand slapped him heartily between the shoulders and inquired rather indignantly say old angel come why don't you ever let folks know your style instead of trottin round like a melancholy clam with his shells shut up tight that's what this crowd wants to know now you've opened down to bedrock we'll get english sam from sonora and get up the tallest kind of a wrestling match not unless english sam meddles with my business you won't replied the deacon quickly i've got enough to do fightin spiritual foes oh said boston ben we'll manage it so the church folks needn't think twas a set-up job we'll put sam up to botherin yer and yer can tackle him at sight then excuse me boston interrupted tom dosser but you don't hit the mark i'm from vermont myself and deacons there don't fight for the fun of it whatever they may do in the village you hail from then turning to the old man tom asked what part of the old state be you from deacon and what fetched you out from nigh rutland replied the deacon i had a nice little place thar and was doin well but the young one's eyes is bad none of the doctors thereabout could do anything for em took her to boston nobody thar would do anything said some of the european doctors were the only ones that could do the job safely cost money goin to europe and payin doctors i couldn't make it to hum in twenty years so i come here only child inquired tom dosser while the boys crowded about the two vermonters and got up a low buzz of sympathetic conversation the old man heard it all and to his lonesome and homesick soul it was so sweet and comforting that it melted his natural reserve and made him anxious to unbosom himself to some one so he answered tom only child of my only daughter father dead inquired tom dosser better be replied the deacon bitterly he left her soon after they were married mean skunk said tom sympathetically i want to judge as i'd be judged replied the deacon but i feel as if i couldn't call that man bad enough names hesby was as good a gal as ever lived but she went to visit some of our folks at burlington and first thing i know she'd writ me she'd met this chap and they'd been married and wanted us to forgive her but he was so good and she loved him so dearly good for the gal said tom and a murmur of approbation ran through the crowd of course we forgave her we'd have done it if she'd married satan himself continued the deacon but we begged her to bring her husband up home and let us look at him whatever was good enough for her to love was good enough for us and we meant to try to love hesby's husband done your credit deacon too declared tom and again the crowd uttered a confirmatory murmur if some folks deacons too was as good but go ahead deacon next thing we heard from her he had gone to the place he was raised in but a friend of his who went with him came back and let out he'd got tight and been arrested she rid him right off begging him to come home and go with her up to our place where he could be out of temptation and where she'd love him dearer than ever pure gold by thunder ejaculated tom while a low you bet was heard all over the room tom's eyes were in such a condition that he thought the deacons were misty and the deacon noticed the same peculiarities about tom she never got a word from him continued the deacon but one of her own came back addressed in his writin the infernal scoundrel growled tom while from the rest of the boys escaped epithets which caused the deacon indignant as he was to shiver with horror 
she was nearly crazy and started to find him but nobody knowed where he was the postmaster said he'd come to the office every day for a fortnight asking for a letter so he must have got hers if all women had such stuff in em sighed tom there'd be one fool less in california excuse me deacon she never give up hopin he'd come back said the deacon in accents that seemed to indicate labored breath and it sometimes seems as if such faith be rewarded by the lord some time or other she teaches pet that's her child to talk about her papa and to kiss his picture and when she and pet goes to sleep his picture's on the pillar between em and the idee that any feller could be mean enough to go back on such a woman deacon i'd track him right through the world and just tell him what you've told us if that didn't fetch him i'd consider it a christian duty and privilege to put a hole through him i couldn't do that replied the deacon even if i was a man of blood for hesby loves him and he's pet's dad besides his picter looks like a decent young chap ain't got no hair on his face and looks more like an innocent boy than anything else hesby thinks pet looks like him and i couldn't touch nobody lookin like pet maybe you'd like to see her picter continued the deacon drawing from his pocket an ambrotype which he opened and handed tom looks sweet as a posy said tom regarding it tenderly them little lips of hern look just like a rose when it don't know whether to open a little further or not the deacon looked pleased and extracted another picture and remarked as he handed it to tom that's pet's mother tom took it looked at it and screamed my wife he threw himself on the floor and cried as only a big-hearted man can cry the deacon gazed wildly about and gasped what's his name tell me quick tom dosser answered a dozen or more that's him bless the lord cried the deacon and finding a seat dropped into it and buried his face in his hands for several moments there was a magnificent attempt at silence but it utterly failed the boys saw that the deacon and tom were working a very large claim and to the best of their ability they assisted stumpy flukes under the friendly shelter of the bar was able to fully express his feelings through his eyelids but the remainder of the party by taking turns at staring out the windows and contemplating the bottles behind the bar managed to delude themselves into the belief that their eyes were invisible finally tom arose deacon boys he said i never got that letter i was afeard she'd hear about my scrape so i wrote her all about it as soon as i got sober and begged her to forgive me and i waited and hoped and prayed for an answer till i growed desperate and came out here she never heard from you thomas sighed the deacon deacon said tom do you suppose i'd have carried this for years here he drew out a small miniature of his wife if i hadn't loved her yes and this too continued tom producing a thin package wrapped in oilskin there's the only two letters i ever got from her and just cause her hand writ em i've had em just where i took em from for four years i got em at albany for i got on that cussed tear and they was both so sweet and wifely that i've never dared to read em since for fear that thinkin on what i'd lost would make me even worse than i am but i ain't afeard now said tom eagerly tearing off the oilskin and disclosing two envelopes he opened one took out the letter opened it with trembling hands stared blankly at it and handed it to the deacon thar's my letter now i got em in the wrong envelope thomas said the deacon the best thing you can do is to deliver that letter yourself and don't let any grass grow under your feet if you can help it i'm going by the first horse i can steal said tom and tell her i'll be along as soon as i pan out enough continued the deacon and tell her said boston ben that the governor won't be much behind you tell her that when the crowd found out how game the old man was and what was on his mind that the court was so ashamed of hisself that he passed round the hat for pet's benefit and here boston ben thoughtfully weighed the hat in his hands and that the apology's heavy enough to do europe a dozen times i know it for i've had to travel myself occasionally here he deposited the venerable tile with its precious contents on the floor in front of the deacon the old man looked at it and his eyes filled afresh as he exclaimed 
god bless you i wish i could do something for you in return don't mention it said boston ben unless you uh, you couldn't make up your mind to match with english sam could you come boys interrupted stumpy flukes it's my treat name your medicine fill high all charged now then bottom up to the meanest man at blugsey's that did mean you deacon exclaimed tom but i claim it myself now so i won't drink it the remainder of the crowd clashed glasses while tom and his father-in-law bowed profoundly then the whole crowd went out to steal horses for the two men had them on the trail within an hour as they rode off stumpy flukes remarked there's a splendid shot ruined for life yes said boston ben with a deep sigh struggling out of his manly bosom and a bully wrestler too the church has got a good deal to answer for for spilin that man's chances End of story twenty eight story twenty nine of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty nine deacon barker's conversion of the several pillars of the church at pawkin centre deacon barker was by all odds the strongest his orthodoxy was the admiration of the entire congregation and the terror of all the ministers within easy driving distance of the deacon's native village he it was who had argued the late pastor of the pawkin centre church into that state of disquietude which had carried him through a few days of delirious fever into the church triumphant and it was also deacon barker whose questions at the examination of seekers for the ex-pastor's shoes had cast such consternation into divinity schools far and near that soon it was very hard to find a candidate for ministerial honors at pawkin centre nor was his faith made manifest by words alone be the weather what it might the deacon was always in his pew both morning and evening in time to join in the first hymn and on every thursday night at a quarter past seven in winter and a quarter before eight in summer the good deacon's cane and shoes could be heard coming solemnly down the aisle bringing to the prayer meeting the champion of orthodoxy nor did the holy air of the prayer meeting even one single evening fail to vibrate to the voice of the deacon as he made in scriptural language humble confessions and tearful pleadings before the throne or still strictly scriptural in expression he warned and exhorted the impenitent the contribution box always received his sixpence as long as specie payment lasted and the smallest fractional currency note thereafter and to each of the regular annual offerings to the missionary cause the bible cause the kindred christian enterprises the deacon regularly contributed his dollar and his prayers the deacon could quote scripture in a manner which put biblical professors to the blush and every principle of his creed so bristled with text confirmatory sustentive and aggressive that doubters were rebuked and freethinkers were speedily reduced to speechless humility or rage but the unregenerate and even some who professed righteousness declared that more fondly than to any other scriptural passage did the good deacon cling to the injunction make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness meekly insisting that he was only a steward of the lord he put out his lord's money that he might receive it again with usury and so successful had he been that almost all mortgages held on property near pock and centre were in the hands of the good deacon and few were the foreclosure sales in which he was not the seller the new pastor at pawkin centre like good pastors everywhere had tortured himself into many a headache over the perplexing question how are we to reach the impenitent in our midst the said impenitent were with but few exceptions industrious honest respectable law-abiding people and the worthy pastor as fully impregnated with yankee thrift as with piety shuddered to think of the waste of souls that was constantly threatening at length like many another pastor he called a meeting of the brethren to prayerfully consider this momentous question 
the deacon came of course and so did all the other pillars and many of them presented their views brother grave thought the final doom of the impenitent should be more forcibly presented deacon struggs had an abiding conviction that it was the man of sin holding dominion in their hearts that kept these people away from the means of grace deacon ponder mildly suggested that the object might perhaps be attained if those within the fold maintained a more godly walk and conversation but he was promptly though covertly rebuked by the good deacon barker who reminded the brethren that it is the spirit that quickeneth brother flight who hadn't any money thought the church ought to build a working man's chapel but this idea was promptly and vigorously combated by all men of property in the congregation by this time the usual closing hour had arrived and after a benediction the faithful dispersed each with about the ideas he brought to the meeting early next morning the good deacon barker with his mind half full of the state of the unconverted and half of his unfinished cowshed took his stick and hobbled about the village in search of a carpenter to finish the incomplete structure there was moggs but moggs had been busy all the season and it would be just like him to want full price for a day's work stubb was idle but stubb was slow auger auger used liquor and the deacon had long ago firmly resolved that not a cent of his money if he could help it should ever go for the accursed stuff but there was hay he hadn't seen him at work for a long time perhaps he would be anxious enough to work to do it cheaply the deacon knocked at hay's door and hay himself shouted come in how are you george said the deacon looking hastily about the room and delightfully determining from the patient face of sad-eyed mrs hay and the scanty furnishings of the yet uncleared breakfast-table that he had been providentially guided to the right spot how's times with ye not very good deacon replied hay nothing much doin in town money's awful scarce groaned the deacon dreadful responded george devoutly thanking the lord that he owed the deacon nothing got much to do this winter asked the deacon not by a d day's job not a single day sorrowfully replied hay the deacon's pious ear had been shocked by the young man's imperfectly concealed profanity and for an instant he thought of administering a rebuke but the charms of prospective cheap labor lured the good man from the path of rectitude i'm fixin my cow shed might perhaps give you a job on it s'pose you'd do it cheap seein how dull everything is the sad eyes of mrs hay grew bright in an instant her husband's heart jumped up but he knew to whom he was talking so he said as calmly as possible three dollars is regular pay the deacon immediately straightened up as if to go too much said he i'd better hire a common laborer at a dollar and a half and a boss of myself it's only a cow shed you know guess though you won't want the nails drove no less particular will you deacon inquired hay but i tell you what i'll do i'll throw off fifty cents a day two dollars ought to be enough george resumed the deacon carpenterin's pooty work and takes a sight a headpiece sometimes but there's no intellect required to work on a cow shed say two dollars and come along the carpenter thought bitterly of what a little way the usual three dollars went and of how much would have to be done with what he could get out of the cowshed but the idea of losing even that was too horrible to be endured so he hastily replied two and a quarter and i'm your man well said the deacon it's a powerful price to pay for work on a cowshed but i s'pose i must stand it hurry up thar's the mill whistle blowin seven hay snatched his tools kissed a couple of thankful tears out of his wife's eyes and was soon busy on the cowshed with the deacon looking on george said the deacon suddenly causing the carpenter to stop his hammer in mid-air think it over again and say two dollars hay gave the good deacon a withering glance and for a few moments the force of suppressed profanity caused his hammer to bang with unusual vigor while the owner of the cowshed rubbed his hands in ecstasy at the industry of his employee 
the air was bracing the winter's sun shone brilliantly the deacon's breakfast was digesting fairly and his mind had not yet freed itself from the influences of the sabbath besides he had secured a good workman at a low price and all these influences combined to put the deacon in a pleasant frame of mind he rambled through his mind for a text which would piously express his condition and texts brought back sunday and sunday reminded him of the meeting of the night before and here was one of those very men before him a good man in many respects though he was higher priced than he should be how was the cause of the master to be prospered if his servants made no effort then there came to the deacon's mind the passage he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins what particular sins of his own needed hiding the deacon did not find it convenient to remember just then but he meekly admitted to himself and the lord that he had them in a general way then with that directness and grace which were characteristic of him the deacon solemnly said george what is to be the sinner's doom i dunno replied george his wrath still warm pears to me you've left that business till pretty late in life deacon don't trifle with sacred subjects george said the deacon still very solemn and with a suspicion of annoyance in his voice the wicked shall be cast into hell with they can't carry their cowsheds with em neither interrupted george consolingly come george said the good deacon in an appealing tone remember the apostle says suffer the word of exhortation excuse me deacon but one sufferin at a time i ain't through sufferin at bein beaten down yet how about the deacon's not bein given to filthy lucre the good deacon was pained and he was almost out of patience with the apostle for writing things which came so handy to the lips of the unregenerate he commenced an industrious search for a text which should completely annihilate the impious carpenter when that individual interrupted him with out with it deacon you had a meetin last night to see what was to be done with the impenitent i was there that is i sot on a stool just outside the door and i heerd all twas said you didn't agree on nothin maybe you fixed it up since anyhow you sot me down for one o the impenitent and you're goin for me well go on nailin interrupted the economical deacon a little testily the noise don't disturb me i can hear ye well what way am i so much wickeder than you to be you and other folks at the meetin house asked hay george i never saw you in god's house in my life replied the deacon well s'pose you haven't is god so small he can't be nowheres except in your little meetin house how about his seeing folks in their closets george said the deacon if you're a prayin man why don't you join yourself to the lord's people why cause the lord's people as you call em don't want me s'pose i was to come to the meetin house in these clothes the only ones i've got do you suppose any of the lord's people's open a pew door for to me and s'pose my wife and children dressed no better than i be but as good as i can afford was with me how do you s'pose i'd feel pride goeth before a fall and a haughty spirit before groaned the deacon when the carpenter again interrupted i feel as if the people of god was a gang of insultin hypocrites and as if i didn't ever want to see em again if that kind of pride sinful the devil's a saint if there's anything wrong about a man's feelin so about himself and them god give him god's to blame for it himself but seein it's the same feelin that makes folks keep themselves straight in all other matters i'll keep on thinkin it's right but the privileges are the gospel george remonstrated the deacon don't you suppose i know what they're worth continued the carpenter haven't i hung around in front of the meetin house summer nights when the winders was open just to listen to the singin and what else i could hear hasn't my wife been with me there many a time and haven't both of us prayed and groaned and cried in our hearts not only cause we couldn't join in it all ourselves but cause we couldn't send the children either without their learnin to hate religion for they fairly knowed what twas haven't i sneaked in to the vestibule winter nights and sought just where i did last night and heard what i'd uh, liked my wife and children to hear and prayed for the time to come when the self-appointed elect shouldn't offend the little ones 
and after sittin there last night and comin home and tellin my wife how folks was concerned about us and our rejoicin together in the hope that some day our children could have the chances we're shut out of now who could come along this mornin but one of those same holy people and jewed me down on pay that the lord knows is hard enough to live on the deacon had a heart and he knew the nature of self-respect as well as men generally his mind ran entirely outside of text for a few minutes and then with a sigh for the probable expense he remarked reckon flight's notion was right after all there ought to be a workin man's chapel ort replied hay who'd you suppose go to it nobody you can rent us second-class houses and sell us second-hand clothing and the cheapest cuts of meat but when it comes to cheap religion nobody knows its value better than we do we don't want to go into your parlors on carpets and furniture we don't know how to use and we don't expect to be asked into society where our talk and manners might make some better educated people laugh but when it comes to religion god knows nobody needs and deserves the very best article more'n we do the deacon was a reasonable man and being old was beginning to try to look fairly at matters upon which he expected soon to be very thoroughly examined the indignant protest of the carpenter had he feared a great deal of reason and yet god's people deserved to hold their position if as usual the argument ended where it began so he asked rather triumphantly what is to be done then reform god's people themselves replied the carpenter to the horror of the pious old man when the right hand of fellowship is reached out to the front instead of stuck behind the back when a poor man comes along there'll be plenty that'll be glad to take it reform your own people deacon for you pick out of your eyes the motes we'll be glad enough to get rid of you can get a fine lot of heavy lumber out of your own soldiers of the cross no more than any other soldiers should stand still and be peppered when unable to reply at least so thought the deacon and he prudently withdrew reform god's people themselves the deacon was too old a boy to tell tales out of school but he knew well enough there was room for reform of course there was weren't we all poor sinners when we would do good wasn't evil ever present with us what business had other sinners to complain when they weren't at least any better besides suppose he were to try to reform the ways of brother graves and deacon struggs and others he had in his mind would they rest until they had attempted to reform him and who was to know just what quantity and quality of reform was necessary be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines the matter was too great for his comprehension so he obeyed the injunction commit thy way unto the lord but the lord relegated the entire matter to the deacon hay did a full day's work the deacon made a neat little sum by recovering on an old judgment he had bought for a mere song and the deacon's red cow made an addition to the family in the calf pen yet the deacon was far from comfortable the idea that certain people must stay away from god's house until god's people were reformed seemed to the deacon's really human heart something terrible if they would be so proud and yet people who would stand outside the meetin house and listen and pray and weep because their children were as badly off as they could scarcely be very proud he knew there couldn't be many such else this out-of-door congregation would be noticed there certainly wasn't a full congregation of modest mechanics in the vestibule of which hay spoke and yet who could tell how many more were anxious and troubled on the subject of their eternal welfare what a pity it was that those working men who wished to repair to the sanctuary could not have steady work and full pay if he had only known all this early in the morning he did not know but he might have hired him at three dollars though really was a man to blame for doing his best in the labor market you cannot serve god and mammon gracious he could almost declare he heard the excited carpenter's voice delivering that text what had brought that text into his head just now he had never thought of it before the deacon rolled and tossed on his bed and the subject of his conversation with the carpenter tormented him so he could not sleep 
of one thing he was certain and that was that the reform of the church at pawkin centre was not to be relied on in an extremity and was not such hungering and thirsting after righteousness an extreme case had he ever really known many such if hay only had means the problem would afford its own solution the good deacon solemnly declared to himself that if hay could give good security he the deacon would try to lend him the money but even this to the deacon extraordinary concession was unproductive of sleep he that giveth to the poor lendeth to the lord there he could hear that indignant carpenter again what an unsatisfactory passage that was to be sure if it would only read the other way it didn't seem a bit business-like the way it stood and yet as the deacon questioned himself there in the dark he was forced to admit that he had a very small balance even of loans to his credit in the hands of the lord he had never lent to the lord except in his usual business manner as small a loan as would be accepted on as extensive collaterals as he could exact oh why did people ever forsake the simple raiment of their forefathers and robe themselves in garments grievous in price and stumbling blocks in the path of their fellow-men but sleep failed even to follow this pious reflection suppose only suppose of course that he were to give uh, lend that is lend hay money enough to dress his family fit for church think what a terrible lot of money it would take a common neat suit for a man would cost at least thirty dollars an overcoat nearly twice as much a suit cloak and other necessities for his wife would amount to as much more and the children oh the thing couldn't be done for less than two hundred and fifty dollars of course it was entirely out of the question he had only wondered what it would cost that was all still no sleep he wished he hadn't spoken with hay about his soul next time he would mind his own business he wished he hadn't employed hay he wished the meeting for consideration of the needs of the impenitent had never taken place no man can come to me except the father which sent me draw him he wished he had remembered that passage and quoted it at the meeting it was no light matter to interfere with the almighty's plans blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy Ha! Ah, could that carpenter be in the room disarranging his train of thought with such such tantalizing texts they had kept him awake and at his time of life a restless night was a serious matter suppose very early the next morning the village doctor returning from a patient's bedside met the deacon with a face which suggested to him the doctor was pious and imaginative abraham on mount moriah the village butcher more practical hailed the good man and informed him he was in time for a fine steak but the deacon shook his head in agony and passed on he neared the carpenter's house stopped tottered and looked over his shoulder as if intending to run at length he made his way behind the house where hay was chopping firewood the carpenter saw him and turned pale he feared the deacon had found cheaper labor and had come to give him warning george said the deacon i've been doing a heap of thinking about what we talked of yesterday i've come to say that if you like i'll lend you three hundred dollars for as long as you've a mind to without note security or interest you to spend as much of it as you need to dress you and your whole family in sunday clothes and to put the balance in the savings bank at interest to go on doing the same with when necessary and all of you go to church when you feel so disposed and if nobody else's pew door opens you're always welcome to mine and may the lord the deacon finished the sentence to himself have mercy on my soul then he said aloud that's all the carpenter at the beginning of the deacon's speech had dropped his axe to the imminent danger of one of his feet as the deacon continued the carpenter dropped his head to one side raised one eyebrow inquiringly and awaited the conditions but when the deacon said that's all george hay seized the deacon's hard old hand gave it a grasp which brought agonized tears to the eyes of its venerable owner and exclaimed deacon god's people are reformin 
the deacon staggered a little he had not thought of it in that light before deacon that money'll do more good than all the prayers you ever done excuse me i must tell mary and the carpenter dashed into the house had mrs hay respected the dramatic proprieties she would have made the deacon a neat speech but the truth is she regarded him from behind the window blind and wiped her eyes with the corner of her apron seeing which the deacon abruptly started for home making less use of his cane than he had done in any day for years it is uh, grievous to relate but truth is mighty that within a fortnight the good deacon repented of his generous action at least fifty times he would die in the poorhouse if he were so extravagant again three hundred dollars was more than the cowshed lumber shingles nails labor and all would cost suppose hay should take the money and go west suppose he should take to drinking and spend it all for liquor one suspicion after another tortured the poor man until he grew thin and nervous but on the second sunday having satisfied himself that hay was in town sober the day before that he had been to the city and brought back bundles and that he the deacon had seldom been in the street without meeting one of hay's children with a paper of hooks and eyes or a spool of thread the deacon stationed himself in one of his own front windows and brought his spectacles to bear on hay's door a little distance off the first bell had rung apparently hours before yet no one appeared could it be that he had basely sneaked to the city at night and pawned everything no the door opened there they came it couldn't be yes it was well he never imagined hay and his wife were so fine a looking couple they came nearer and the deacon forgetting his cane hobbled hurriedly to church entered his pew and left the door wide open he waited long it seemed to him but they did not come he looked around impatiently and there oh joy and wonder the president of the pawkins savings institution had invited the whole family into his pew just then the congregation rose to sing the hymn commencing from all that dwell below the skies let the creator's praise arise and the deacon in his excitement distanced the choir and the organ and the congregation and almost brought the entire musical service to a standstill the deacon had intended to watch closely for hay's conversion but something wonderful prevented it was reported everywhere that the deacon himself had been converted and all who now saw the deacon fully believed the report he was even heard to say that as there seemed to be some doubt as to whether faith or works was the saving virtue he intended thereafter to practise both he no longer mentions the poor house as his prospective dwelling but is heard to say that in his father's house there are many mansions and that he is laying up his treasure in heaven as fast as possible and hopes he may get it all on the way there before his heart is called for at the post office the tin shop and the rum shop the deacon's conversion is constantly discussed and men of all degrees now express a belief in the almighty power of the spirit from on high other moneyed men have been smitten and changed and the pastor of the pawkin centre church daily thanks the lord for such a revival as he never heard of before End of story twenty nine Story thirty of Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story thirty Joe Gatter's Life Insurance. Good! He was the model boy of Bungfield. While his idle schoolmates were flying kites and playing marbles, the prudent Joseph was trading Sunday school tickets for strawberries and eggs, which he converted into currency of the Republic as he grew up and his old schoolmates purchased cravats and hair oil at squire tacky's store it was the industrious joseph who stood behind the counter wrapped up their purchases and took their money when the same boys stood on the street corners and cast sheep's eyes at the girls the business-like joseph stood in the store door and contemplated these same boys with eyes such as a hungry cat 
casts upon a brood of young birds who he expects to eat when they grow older joe never wasted any time at parties he never wore fine clothing he never drank nor smoked in short joe was so industrious that by the time he reached his majority he had a thousand dollars in the bank and not a solitary virtue in his heart for joe's money good squire tacky had an earnest longing and soon had it to his own credit while the sign over the store door read tacky gatter then the squire wanted joe's soul too and so earnest was he that joe soon found it necessary to remonstrate with his partner twon't do squire said he religion's all very well in its place but when a man loses the sale of a dozen eggs profit seven cents because his partner is talking religion with him so hard that a customer gets tired of waiting and goes somewhere else then religion's out of place the human soul's of more consequence than many eggs joseph argued the squire that's just it replied joe money don't hit the value of the soul anyway and there's no use trying to mix em and while we're talkin don't you think we might be mixin some of the settings of the molasses barrel with the brown sugar twill make it way better the squire sighed but he could not help admitting that joe was as good a partner as a man could want in one of joe's leisure moments it struck him that if he were to die nobody would lose a cent by the operation the idea was too exasperating and soon the local agents of noted insurance companies ceased to enjoy that tranquillity which is characteristic of business men in the country within a fortnight two of the agents were arraigned before their respective churches for profane brawling while joe had squeezed certain agents into dividing commissions to the lowest unit of divisibility and had several policies in the safe at the store the squire his partner was agent for the pantagonian mutual and endured his full share of the general agony joe had caused but when he had handed joe a policy and receipt and taken the money and counted it twice and seen to it carefully that all the bills were good the good squire took his revenge joseph said he ye ain't through with insurance yet you need to insure your soul against risk in the next world and there's only one agent that does it the junior partner stretched himself on the counter and groaned he knew the squire was right he had heard that same story from every minister he had ever heard joe was so agitated that he charged at twelve and a half cents some calico he had sold at fifteen only one agent but the shrewd joseph rejoiced to think that those who represented the great agent differed greatly in the conditions of the insurance and that some made more favourable terms than others and that if he could get the ministers thoroughly interested in him he would have a good opportunity for comparing rates the good men all wanted joe for he was a rising young man and could if the spirit moved him make handsome subscriptions to good purposes so in their zeal they soon regarded each other with jealous eyes and reduced their respective creeds to gossamer thinness they agreed about grace being free and joe accepted that much promptly as he did anything which could be had without price but joe was a practical man and though he found fault with none of the doctrines talked at him he yet hesitated to attach himself to any particular congregation he finally ascertained that the rev barzillai driftwood's church had no debt and that its contributions to missions and other religious purposes were very small so joe allowed himself to be gathered into the fine assortment of crooked sticks which the rev barzillai driftwood was reserving unto the day of burning great was the rejoicing of the congregation at joe's saving act and sincere was the sorrow of the other churches who knew their own creeds were less shaky but in the saloon and on the street joe's religious act was discussed exclusively on its merits and the results were such as only special spiritual labor would remove for no special change was noticeable in joe on sunday he abjured the world but on monday he made things uncomfortable for the widow mcnilty whose husband had died in the dead of tacky gatter 
a customer bought some gingham on joe's assurance that the colors were fast but the first wash day failed to confirm joe's statement the proprietor of the stage line between bungfield and Clepus valley traded horses with joe and was afterward heard mentioning his new property in language far more scriptural than proper still joe was a church member and that was a patent of respectability and as he gained years and building lots and horses and uh, commenced discounting notes his respectability grew and waxed great in the minds of the practical people of bungfield even good women real mothers in israel could not help thinking as they sorrowed over the sand in the bottoms of their coffee cups and grew wrathful at runny flour bought for a one superfine of tacky gadder that joe would make a valuable husband so thought some of the ladies of bungfield and as young ladies who can endure the idea of such a man for perpetual partner can also signify their opinions joe began to comprehend that he was in active demand he regarded the matter as he would a sudden demand for any commodity of trade and by skilfully manipulating the market he was soon enabled to choose from a full supply thenceforward joe was as happy as a man of his nature could be all his investments were paying well the store was prosperous he was successful in all his trading enterprises he had purchased at fearful shaves scores of perfectly good notes he realized on loans interest which would cause a usury law to shrivel and crack his insurance policies brought him fair dividends and his wife kept house with economy and thrift but the church the church seemed an unmitigated drag joe attended all the church meetings determined to get the worth of the money he was compelled to contribute to the current expenses he had himself appointed treasurer so he could get the use of the church money but the interest even at the rates joe generally obtained did not balance the amount of his contribution joe worried over the matter until he became very peevish yet he came no nearer a business-like adjustment of receipts and expenditures one day when his venerable partner presented him a certificate of dividend from the pantagonian mutual joe remarked never got any dividends on that other insurance you put me up to taking partner that gainst fire risks in the next world you know twill be tough if there's any mistakes church does take a side of money joseph said the squire in a sorrowful tone i've always been afeard they didn't look enough into your evidences when they took you into that church how can a man expect to escape on the day of wrath if he's all the time grumbling at the cost of his salvation mistake if you don't know in your heart the truth of what you profess there's mighty little hope for you church or no church no in my heart cried joe that's a pretty kind of security is that what i've been paying church dues for better have known it in my heart in the first place and saved the money what's the use of believing all these naughty points if they don't make a sure thing for a man if your belief don't make you any better or happier joseph rejoined the squire you'd better look again and see if you've got a good hold of it those that's got a clear title don't find their investment as slow in making returns while those that find fault are generally the ones that made a mistake poor joe he thought he had settled this whole matter but now if his partner was right he was worse off than if he hadn't begun he believed in justification by faith now wasn't his faith strong first class he might say to be sure of being safe hadn't he believed everything that all the ministers had insisted upon as essential and what was faith if it wasn't believing he would ask his partner the old man had got him into this scrape now he must see him through squire said he isn't faith the same thing as believing well said the squire adjusting his glasses and taking from the desk the little testament upon which he administered oaths that depends on how you believe here's a verse on the subject thou believest in god thou doest well the devils also believe and tremble ugh joe shivered 
he wasn't an aristocrat but would one fancy such companionship as the squire referred to here said the squire turning the leaves is another passage barren on the subject o generation of vipers who hath warned you to escape from the wrath to come bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance vipers joe uncomfortably wondered who else the squire was going to introduce into the brotherhood of the faith now see what it says in another place continued the squire not every one that saith unto me lord lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my father which is in heaven yes said joe grateful for hearing of no more horrible believers but what is his will but believing on him don't the bible say that they that believe shall be saved joseph said the squire when you believed in my store you put in your time and money there when you believed in hostraden you devoted yourself to practice in it when you believed life insurance was a good thing you took out policies and paid for them though you have complained of the patagonian dividends now if you do believe in god what have you done to prove it i paid over a hundred dollars a year church dues said joe wrathfully not counting subscriptions to a bell and a new organ that wasn't for god joseph said the squire twas all for you god never will thank you for running an asylum for paupers fit to work you'll find in the twenty-fifth chapter of matthew a description of those that's going into the kingdom of heaven they're the people that give food and clothing to the needy and that visit the sick and prisoners while those that don't do these things don't go in to put it mildly he don't say a word about belief there joseph for he knows that giving away property don't happen till a man's belief is pretty strong joe felt troubled could it really be that his eternal insurance was going to cost more money joe thought enviously of colonel bung president of the bungfield railroad company the colonel didn't believe in anything so he saved all his money and joe wished he had some of the colonel's courage joe's meditations were interrupted by the entrance of sam ottry a poor fellow who owed joe some money joe had lent sam a hundred dollars discounted ten per cent for ninety days and secured by a chattel mortgage on sam's horse and wagon but sam had been sick during most of the ninety days and when he went to joe to beg a few days of grace that exemplary business man insisted upon immediate payment it was easy to see by sam's hopeless eye and strained features that he had not come to pay he was staring ruin in the face and felt as uncomfortable as if the amount were millions instead of a horse and wagon his only means of support as for joe he had got that hundred dollars and horse and wagon mixed up in the oddest way with what he and his partner had been talking about it was utterly unbusinesslike he knew it he tried to make business business and religion religion but try as he might he could not succeed joe thought briskly he determined to try an experiment sam said he got the money no sam replied luck's agin me i've got to stand it i s'pose sam said joe i'll give you all the time you need at legal interest sam was not such a young man as sentimental people would select to try good deeds upon but he was human and loved his wife and children and the sudden relief he felt caused him to look at joe in a manner which made joe find a couple of entire strangers in his own eyes he hurried into the little office and when his partner looked up inquiringly joe replied i've got a dividend squire one of those we were talking about how's that asked the old man while joe commenced writing rapidly i'll show you said joe handing the squire the paper on which he had just put in writing his promise to sam joseph said the squire after reading the paper several times to assure himself that his eyes did not deceive him it beats the widow's mites she gave the lord all she had but you've given him more than you ever had in all your life until to-day joe handed sam the paper and it was to the teamster the strongest evidence of christianity he had ever seen in bungfield he had known of some hard cases turning from the saloon and joining the church but none of these things were so wonderful as this action of joe gatter's 
sam told the story in strict confidence to each of his friends and the good seed was thus sown in soil that it had never reached before it would be pleasant to relate that joe forthwith ceased shaving notes and selling antiquated grease for butter and that he devoted the rest of his days and money to good deeds but it wouldn't be true those of our readers who have always consistently acted according to their own light and knowledge are of course entitled to throw stones at joe gatter but most of us know to our sorrow why he didn't always act according to the good promptings he received our only remaining duty is to say that when thereafter joe's dividends came seldom he knew who to blame End of story thirty.